Um, okay. Here we go. The uh, Bible study I have been doing is actually a product of our Sunday morning service. Um, Andy had our service this week. We were at their house. And as usually happens, during, during the message, the Lord pricks me with some particular scripture or phrase or something like that. And so that's what I started studying. And again, I'm sharing my personal Bible study. I'm not trying to teach doctrine or anything like that. I'm just sharing my personal Bible study. Hopefully that will spur you guys on to do your own study. Um, and the scripture that I'm going to kind of cover this morning was, uh, it's something that I've studied a lot. Hey, Carol. Hey, <laughs> Shelly. Okay. Yay. Um, but I, anyway, I was actually cleaning up the bathroom this morning and I thought, you know, I've studied this scripture so many times and I just, um, you know, it seems like I always get something out of it. And, and the Lord pricked me that there are some scriptures that are like roast beef. You, you can have them on a regular basis and it's always good. So today, my Bible study, I think it's a roast beef supper. I think it's, um, it's got a lot of meat in it. And I have, once again, learned a lot. Um, uh, okay, so let's go. 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 10 is the... Um, I'm trying to uh, see if this is going to show the comments really good as I go through. Yes, I can see them right there. Okay, so y'all be sure to comment, ask questions, share, because it's always better to Bible study when folks are sharing too. Okay, 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 10. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness with the Lord, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Do thy diligence to come unto me shortly unto me. Now this is the thing that sparked it. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Christians to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. So, what that sparked in me was, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Now, here's the thing. Andy's message was was about being broken and we all could be broken we all could fail and that was his message and it was really excellent and he was just encouraging us to keep going to not give up you know as time goes along things are going to get much worse for Christians and because of that we've got to be established we've got to have a great foundation and like I said when he read the part about Demas hath forsaken me having loved this present world you know initially I think well I don't love this world now that's fact but I went back and looked, and I think Demas was mentioned three times, three separate times. And he was hand in hand with Paul. He was there, he was working, and now he is forsaken him. We don't know what things about this world he loved. Maybe he was just tired of getting arrested. Because let's face it, Paul got arrested quite a bit. Maybe he was tired of the travel. Maybe he was tired of... of um, 
the problems he kept seeing and frustrated. You know, ministers get frustrated like everybody else. But anyway, it was because he loved this present world, and that's what I wanted to study out. So if you've got your Bible, Second Peter 1, 3 through 10 is what I'm studying today. And um, trying to pull down and make sure if y'all are commenting. Um, okay, verse number three. And I'm starting back at three. I could start at verse one, but oh, this is Peter. Second Peter um, three through ten. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Now, again, I'm looking at this because of Demas loving this present world. I'm, I wanted to find out, to study out, how to not fail, how to not fall. You know, all of us think we've got it together at some point or another. I don't want to fail. I don't want to fall. I don't want to give in. I don't want to love this world. So I, that's where the Lord led me into this scripture. So I was looking at, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. That means he's covered all the bases for us. There's nothing lacking he's provided. But the next phrase, through the knowledge of him, that's how we got all things, understanding him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Now, I looked up glory. You remember when I told you about the Strong's Concordance and the New Testament is Greek. So in the Greek, the word that they used for glory meant dignity, honor, and excellence that have called us to glory, dignity, honor, and excellence. And excellence, that's the word that catches. Excellence. And virtue, moral, excellence, purity. And then the other word that I found was courage. Wow. Virtue also means courage. Wow. We need courage, and that's what he's called us to. And when you are requiring courage in your life, that's probably because there's something difficult going on. I mean, do y'all agree? That's okay, Annie. I'm glad you're here. So, hath called us to glory and virtue. Verse 4. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Whereby, I'm trying to keep up with y'all's comments, y'all. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, Precious not meaning like, oh, isn't that precious? Precious meaning like rare and beautiful and excellent. That by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. Remember, the goal here is not to fall, not to fail in our striving towards the things of God. So he's provided great and precious promises so that we can be partakers of his divine nature. The nature of God, I absolutely want that. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, I want to escape the corruption. I see it all around me every day. You can click on Facebook in five seconds. You can see corruption. But then, that is in the world through lust. And I looked up lust. We all think we know what lust is, but let's face it. We need to really study lust because I think I've conquered some lusts. You know what I'm saying? I think I've gotten past some things like that. But then there's other things. That, and I'll tell you, you want to know where I, I 
I have a weakness. Hang on, I'm going to show you. Did I just move the camera around? See this right here? Victoria Magazine. This is such a pretty magazine. And I mean, look, little girl holding a kitten. How great is that? But I, I have to be careful when I'm looking through here to not covet things for my home. Um, I love the recipes in here. I love the, there's poetry, there's uh, flower arrangements. I love this magazine because it, it's just pretty. And as a woman, it's my job to make my home pretty, inviting, a haven, a peaceful place for my family, for my husband. But I don't want to be covetous. I don't want to have the lust of the eyes cause me to become corrupt in my heart and greedy and selfish and discontented with my life. Y'all know what I'm saying? So as I'm reading through here, I'm asking God, you know, am I letting the lust of the world cause me to be corrupted in my heart? Um, like I said, lust, desire, craving, longing. Desire for what is forbidden. Be careful about longing for things that you don't have. Now, if it's a godly thing, obviously you need to strive toward godly things. But if you, like social media, if you get on there and you see a picture of something somebody posted and you just go, oh, I wish I had that. If I had that, I could be happy. No. No. That's a lust of the eyes. Don't do that. Don't do that to yourself. Don't do that to your spirit. It's not godly. If you can be thankful for what they have or what they're showing. Um, my friend, a godly, godly woman, she's up in Canada. Hiding, going to all these beautiful places. And, and, you know, you think, oh, I wish I could see that. I would love to see that. But you got to be careful. You don't want to be coveting her experience. You know, I have to say to myself, if God wants me to see those things, he's going to work that out for me. But I'm not going to sit here being discontented. Again, that's what brings in the corruption. We want to escape that. Um, and also, 1 John 2.16. You need to jot that down when you're talking about uh, escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. John, First John two sixteen, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it is of this world. Now let me pull down and make sure I hadn't. Oh, bless your heart. I love y'all's comments. I don't want to miss anybody. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. I'm trying to do this where I can watch it on my computer so I can see your comments. Um, but if I miss something, y'all just forgive me. You are getting my noises because people are missing me. And I can't cut that off. I don't know how to cut that off. So when you hear that chime, that means somebody's messaged me on Facebook. Okay. Lust of the flesh. Things that your flesh desires. That's like overeating, drinking, sexual desires, all kind of things like that. Lust of the eyes. Things that you see. Um, things that you see. And the pride of life, and we all know what pride is, and pride, you know, I did a Bible study one time where I was studying about pride. You know, pride is really a root. It's like, it's like ground zero for sin, because when pride gets into you, talk about corruption, wow, that just opens the door for everything else. But those are the things that... We've got to overcome so that we don't fail. And we got to, you know, you really have to go through your daily life and in sort of, in a way, pigeonhole this stuff. 
Like, we know when we're in sin. We know when we're coveting things. And, and you know, the Holy Spirit will prick your mind. You know, we talked about that last week with sanctification. The Holy Spirit pricks our mind. And, and sometimes just do this as a little exercise. Just pigeonhole those thoughts and say, okay. I know that wasn't of God, so was that pride of life? Was that lust of the eyes? Was that lust of the flesh? And when you start pigeonholing where those things are coming from, you can do battle with them, and you can you can see where your weaknesses are and fight those things. Um, okay, verse 5. And beside this, giving all diligence, all diligence, when I realized that my diabetes was getting out of control, out of control in that every couple of years I was having, having to up a medicine or add a new medicine, and I did not want to keep going that way, and I said, okay, God, I've got to lose some weight. I've got to get a handle on this. And I started working really, really hard to lose the weight. This is before I found the low-carb thing. That really helped me, but... I lost like, I think I lost like 16 pounds and I went to my doctor and we were talking about it. He was so proud of me. I said, but Dr. Fisher, here's the problem. I can't think of anything else. I have to just think about um, what I'm eating. It's like I can't, I can't, I can't do anything else. It totally consumes my thoughts. And he said, well, yeah, I understand that, but... Right now, that is that is one of the most important things. Well, this is one of the most important. This is the most important thing. We have to give all diligence. And while we have to function each and every day and do all the stuff, be a wife, be a mother, be a, a friend, be a sister, be all the things we have to do, plan supper, clean the house, run the errands, pay the bills, this is what we really need to give all diligence to. Because if you fail at this, you don't succeed in anything else. Spiritual success is is primary. And Shelley just wrote, that is so true. We have to be able to humble ourselves before God to acknowledge the sin in our life. But when we cling to pride, we cannot be humble before the Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay, Carol said verse 17. Post it, Carol, because I didn't read verse 17 and I'm in Second Peter chapter 1. I know what you're talking about, but I didn't read it for this study, so post it for me if you can. Um, okay, giving all diligence. Now, here comes our list. And as I was looking through this list, you know, initially... You want to think, okay, it's like steps. You take this step, and then this step, and then this step, and then this step, and you keep going up until you're like, you get at the top, okay, we've done it, we've accomplished it. I don't, I, in my studying, I don't think that's how it works. Because it's like, in that, in that scenario, it's like you're taking a step, and you're leaving the former thing behind, like, okay, that's conquered, so now we can go on up here. And I, I don't I don't think that's how that works. And y'all forgive me for this analogy, but being a gardener, and those of you that are gardeners are gonna understand what I'm saying. But it's sort of like it's sort of like compost. I know, I know, I hate to use that in connection with the things of God, but it's just the way it came to me. The Lord knows I need to be simple in my understanding um but when like like the soil mix you know if i'm if i'm starting seeds i i get perlite i get vermiculite i get peat moss i add in a little bit of soil i add in some rotted leaves okay carol and the world is passing away and also it's lust but the one who does the will of god abides forever yes amen Amen. Oh, I love it that I can see y'all stuff. Thanks, Nissa. <laughs> yes, he did. He was a gardener. <laughs> okay. So, when you're starting seeds, you know, and you got to get your soil mixed and you got to get it just right, and you're adding all this stuff in. 
um, you have to get it in balance. First of all, it's not going to absorb water if you don't get it in balance, which is a whole nother Bible study about the water of the word. But so when I look at this, this list of things we're about to go through, that's what I'm thinking. I'm equating in my mind. It's like the soil mix, the compost that you're, you're working together so you can get this beautiful thing to grow. And this thing is you spiritually. I want to grow so strong. Now, I don't know where y'all live down here when tornadoes come through. Straight line winds will uproot a tree that's been there 200 years. I mean, the whole root system comes up. But then we get to look at it. The roots weren't so much deep as they were broad. I want my roots to be deep. I want them to be so deep that no storm can topple my tree, my spirit life. And hey, I've been through some serious storms. I've been through some hurricanes. But I know there's more coming. And I don't want anything to cause me to fall. I think y'all are making comments. Maybe I'm not seeing them, but that's okay. I'll try to see them. I'll try to pay more attention to them. Okay. Amen. So, let's look at the list. Again, we are in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 10. And actually, I'll probably put in 11 too. Um, and beside this, in verse 5, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. Faith is the basis. It's the foundation. And when I looked up in the Strong's, faith relating to Christ, a strong, and this was a da-da-da-da, and welcome conviction or belief that Jesus is the Messiah through him we obtain eternal salvation in the kingdom of God. A strong and welcome conviction. Okay, are y'all seeing that? I like stop my tracks when I read that. There are people who awaken to the conviction of the Holy Spirit, but they don't welcome it. And it takes no root. You know, it's like the parable of the four soils. One of them was good. So the seed dropped in four different soils. One of them took root and grew. That's the one I want to be. Some of them, it didn't take root at all. Some of them took root a little bit. Some of them withered in the heat. You know, the birds, all that came. I want to be the one that takes root. And the way, the only way you get to do that is if you have a strong and welcome conviction of Jesus Christ as the Messiah. You know, sometimes we don't welcome the promptings of the Holy Spirit. We get kind of ill at him, don't we, though? That is not an attitude that is going to produce fruit in your life. Well, it's going to produce fruit, but not godly fruit. And if you let that happen enough, you're going to give up. You're going to fail. You've got to welcome the Holy Spirit even when he is correcting you. And that's what I tell my grandbabies. I don't know about y'all, but when my grandbabies are here at my house and they're not behaving, they get a spanking if I know they're in just pure rebellion. And I tell them, if you are yelling, fussing, arguing or trying to get away from me when I'm spanking you, you are not receiving the discipline. So you're going to stand still, you're going to be quiet, and you're going to receive it. It is amazing when you explain to a child what you are doing and you remain calm, how much better it works. And they don't do it again because they understand fully and we've got to be welcoming to the conviction. That is what brings or allows faith to grow in us. So, this scripture. Add to your faith virtue. Bring on over virtue a little bit. And um, one of my friends asked me, could we do a Psalms, uh, 
Proverbs 31 Bible study online and Virtuous Woman, and I think we will do that sooner or later, but um, virtue, moral excellence, purity, and courage. Again, don't you love that courage? Carol wrote, correction discipline is disciple is absolutely essential for us to learn his ways no matter how old we are. Yes, ma'am. And Nissa, I hear you knocking, Lord, but you can't come in. <laughs> okay, Nissa, you are just too much like me. I love it. Okay, knowledge. Add to your faith virtue. Add to virtue knowledge. Knowledge signifies in general intelligence understanding. The general knowledge of Christian religion. I hate that word religion, don't y'all? But here's the next the de next definition. The deeper, more perfect and enlarged knowledge of this religion such as belongs to the more advanced especially of things lawful and unlawful for Christians moral wisdom which is seen in right living so we're going to add to our faith you know our foundation our true belief our welcome conviction virtue which is courage um, wait a minute, excellence and purity. Yeah, there's, there's so much, much to talk about, about virtue and desire and pure before the Lord and not to be tainted. And I'm telling you, we need to do a Bible study on that. Because, boy, stuff starts welling up in my spirit on that topic. Okay. And to knowledge, temperance. Temperance, self-control. That's right. You do have to have the word for knowledge. Excellent, Lenny. Let's stop on that for a moment. If you're not studying the word of God, how do you know what you're supposed to do? little side note. Do not read tons of commentaries. Do not get your word just from what the preacher's preaching. I'm sure the preachers are preaching their heart. But the word is the undiluted real deal. Get in this word. I'm not going to go through a whole bunch of discussion about versions of the Bible. But let me tell you something. Every time they come up with a version they have to change it at least 10 percent from whatever else so that they can publish it you need to stick with one bible i use the king james version new american standard is one that paul says is also good we don't use anything else i'm not bashing anybody who does but i'm telling you if you don't study the word you're just getting everything diluted. It's amazing, amazing when you go back in there and just read it yourself like you're reading it for the first time. Oh, there's so much good stuff in there. It's all good. Relationship is the right word. I'm with you on the religion. Amen. Okay, you have to have the word in you if you want to succeed at all. It's got to become precious. That is where the knowledge comes from. And to knowledge, temperance. Temperance is self-control. The virtue of one who masters his desires and passions. And y'all know this, but Satan comes and buffets us. And he puts things before us. That isn't sin. Sin is when you dwell on it and meditate on it and ponder it and let it start taking root within your thought life that's when it becomes sin it's when you make a decision within yourself however slight to entertain ungodliness that's when you switch over from temptation to sin and self-control temperance is that act 
of controlling. We have a little phrase we use with the kids about policing yourself. We go camping, we police the area before we leave. We go pick up all the trash, anything that we might have left behind that's not supposed to be there. And I tell them, are you policing yourself with your mouth? Are you saying things and not catching them before they come out? You need, we need to control ourselves. We need to police our own lives and correct those things before God has to come in and do it. That's temperance. That's self-control. And we all have areas. I mean, obviously, I'm in the world that I eat more than I should. I need to have temperance in that. I, I'm not the least bit tempted to drink alcohol. That's not part of my life. But I tell you what, you put a Klondike bar in front of me or a Hershey, oh, I have to battle that thing. I'm a chocolate person. Some people need temperance when it's watching television. Um, some people need temperance when it's going shopping. You know, there's lots of things that, that can attack us and can hinder us from focusing on God. And Shelly just wrote, uh, Amen, our pastor encourages us to go read it ourselves every week to see it in the word ourselves because he says he's human and he can on occasion say something differently than he intends it to come out. We're personally responsible for checking the word and making sure we fully understand it correctly. Yes. Oh, Shelly. Maybe you can reboot or something really quick. Okay, all right, add to knowledge temperance and to temperance patience. Oh, that is the hardest one. Never, never, never pray for patience. That is not a good thing to pray for because then stuff starts happening to help you grow your patience. And this is not a joke. I knew a lady that prayed for patience and seriously, she got pregnant with triplets. That is not a joke. Now the most patient person in the world. She had to be. Don't pray for patience. But exercise patience. Calm yourself down. If something's going on and you're getting impatient about it, realize that you are in a battle. And you need to get in the Word. You need to find some scriptures to stand on. And exercise your patience and make it grow stronger. Mm-hmm. He sure will, girl. Mm-hmm. Okay. Patience. Steadfastness. Constancy. Endurance. I found this quote and I loved it. In the New Testament, the characteristic of a man who is not swerved from his deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith and piety by even the greatest trials and sufferings, steadfast waiting for a sustaining perseverance. I love that. Patience. Not swerved from his deliberate purpose. Okay, now here's a confession. And see, this is why I do my Bible study this way, because the Lord just throws things up at me and he says, uh-huh. You, you need to work on that. I I am just really bad of allowing myself to get distracted when I'm doing things. So let's say I'm, I'm doing laundry and I'm going around the house and I'm collecting laundry. Got two bathrooms, you know, the, the kitchen. I'm, I'm just going through collecting stuff that, you know, when folks are here, they just, you know, put here and there. Sure's the world. I'll go to the other bathroom. On the way to the other bathroom, I see toys laying in the dining room where the kids have been here. So I stop. I got my armload of, of towels. I stop. I go grab up those toys. And that's one reason I wear a basket. I mean, a, a basket, an apron. I lift it up. I stuff toys in there. Well, then that makes me go to the guest room slash playroom. Put those toys up. Up. The kids have been playing on there. So I'm drop my towels, go over there, straighten up the bed, put the pillows back on there, pick up my laundry, come out in the hallway. That shelf is covered in dust. So what do I do? 
I take part of my apron, I move everything, I start dusting. 30 minutes later, I'm still toting around this armful of towels that needed it to be in the laundry, washing. I'm terrible about that. That's distraction. And when I did this, who was not swerved from his deliberate purpose, yeah, I'm studying this topic of patience right there, but still it brought that to my mind. I need to stop being swerved from my deliberate purpose. First of all, I need to know what my purpose is, and that goes back to the knowledge. Remember, we're making our compost. I need to not be swerved. I need to have a deliberate purpose. I need to focus. Focus, focus, focus. It's vital for us to be a success at anything. Have patience, have patience. Don't be in such a hurry. If you don't have patience, you only start to worry. Remember, remember that God is patient too. And think of all the times that others have to wait for you. Oh, that's good. I like that. Oh, Shelly, I'm sorry it's frozen. Ugh. Okay. Add to temperance and to temperance patience and to patience godliness. Now, I didn't look up godliness because I think that's pretty self-explanatory. But let's go back to knowledge. Like Lenny said, you got to have the word. If you don't get the word in you, how are you going to know what godliness is? I was talking to one of my friends online one day and we were talking talking about in the word and you know a lot of people have bible study well they have bible reading time get up every morning read a chapter or if you're doing the one year bible you know you got these set chapters that you're going to read every day and you read them and then you get up and go do your next thing that's not bible study y'all it's good do that but but you need to set a time to study you need to you know, like I said, Blue Letter Bible is wonderful because right there you can put up the scripture, you can, you can check the Strong's meanings. If you get totally confused, you can pull up a commentary. I love Matthew Henry, by the way. Um, but you need to study stuff because just reading it, you know, you might read it and five minutes later somebody have a conversation with you and then you think, now what was I reading? It just it, it's fleeting, and Satan loves to steal that little seed that you put in there. But when you study, going back to the gardening thing, you you're tilling up the soil, you're amending the soil, you're putting a little compost in, you're planting your seed, you're pulling the soil back over, you're tamping it down, you're watering it, you're going out the next day, water it a little bit more. That's how you get growth. That's how you get fruit. But just this fly by, you know, read a few scriptures. Okay, I did my Bible reading. That That's not going to get it. That's just not going to get it. You've got to study. Okay. And I'm saying that about godliness because you've got to study to know what godliness is. If you don't understand what God is and who God is and how he is and what is his character traits, you can't do, you can't be like him because you don't have a clue who he is. And let me tell you, God is not mean. God is not a hypocrite. He's not angry. He's not bitter. He's not vengeful. He's not sullen. He doesn't have all those emotions that we have. Um, he is very loving. He's not mean. And, and ooh. <sighs> Another rabbit trail, but an important one. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. People aren't kind anymore. And we need to be kind to the saints. We need to be kind to everybody, but especially our brothers and sisters in Christ. Not rude. Not rude. And to brotherly kindness, charity. Charity is love. That's what it is. Verse 8. For if these things be in you, oh good, Shelley. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall not be barren. Let me read that again, make sure I read that right. 
For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful. I looked it up. In this usage for the word barren, it means lazy, slothful, and idle. And unfruitful, producing nothing. Now, if you look at those two things, barren, this is my studying of it, barren looks to be internal. Normally, I would think of barren as like not being able to have a child, not being able to produce a child. But the Greek word that was used for this word barren means lazy, slothful, and idle. All of that is stuff inside of us. You see what you see where I'm going on that? I I find that very enlightening. If these things that I read, which is faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, um, brotherly kindness, and I forgot one didn't I virtue knowledge okay if I have all that in me and it's abounding it can't just be in me it has to actually be functioning they will make me not be spiritually lazy now there have been times in my life where the stuff going on in my life I just I, I just didn't you know what I mean? I just, I just disposed empty of fruit. Yes. Oh. Yes. 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 Idle, slothful, and lazy. Father, forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive me. Lord, those times that I wasted, that I should have been diligent. Nothing producing, nothing producing. So, barren, internal, lazy, slothful, unfruitful, external. What's going on in here is going to be seen out here. That's just the way it works. If my blood pressure is up, Paul walks in the door, he can tell it. I don't have to say a word. He can look at me and see. Not because I'm like green or something, but because my eyes don't look right. He hears my voice. He can tell I'm not feeling quite right. Uh, all you mamas and grandmamas, you can look at your babies and you can see in their eyes when they don't feel good. When they wake up in the morning, you can see in their eyes when they're getting sick. Even before they may realize that you can see it. The stuff that's churning inside is going to be visible outside. Okay? That's one of the things about modest dress. You know, I see people posting, Oh, the Lord doesn't care what you're wearing outside. That's what's going on inside. Well, guess what? What's going on inside becomes extremely visible on the outside. Yep. It all works together, don't it? Okay, verse 9. I don't miss any comments. But he that lacks these things is blind. Now, we've already seen what's going to be produced. He that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten the word for his own sins. Hmm.
But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath, hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. You know, we were talking last week about sanctification. And there's a huge debate about whether or not a person can actually live in this world, on this side of eternity, perfect. And yet, there's undeniably scripture, undeniably, Nightly, we see scriptures that say be perfect, okay? And like I said, that's a whole that's a whole Bible study unto itself. Just just that little section right there. But when we receive Jesus, now stay with me and remember, I'm not trying to teach you doctrine. I'm I'm thinking. My own Bible study, I'm sharing with you what goes through my spirit. Okay? If we received justification when we accepted Jesus in our heart and the ability for sanctification, and then we walk our daily walk, becoming sanctified, because he said sanctify yourself, so we're doing that daily walking in that, becoming sanctified, and then at the end, when we meet up with Jesus, however you think that's going to happen, when you finally are at the end of it, you are fully sanctified. Walking in, getting to that point of perfection. This verse is what strikes me. If we're not doing this other stuff, which is leading us, and and this is the stuff that you do to walk in sanctification, to sanctify yourself. Does that make sense? I mean, I'm being out loud here, but I think adding knowledge to knowledge, temperance, to temperance, patience, to patience, that's what, how we're growing in sanctification, right? I mean, that is the process. This, right so then we get to verse 9 if we're not doing this stuff we become blind blind to what we can't see what the end result is going to be we can't see the benefits in the future to what we're doing and and we forget that we got released from the without and this is what just popped into my spirit. I bought a roasting pan, a new, probably a 1950s model roasting pan. It's huge. It's big. It's got the rack inside. I bought it at a flea market kind of place. When I got it home, I got an SOS pad out. I scrubbed that thing. I scrubbed that thing. I mean, I, I probably for an hour... I scrubbed every little nook and cranny, you know, where the rim rolls up and the handles. I scrubbed that whole thing till it was just shining. And then I was going to use it Sunday morning to put the roast in for Sunday lunch. So like at 7 o'clock, I get it out of the cabinet. I had to scrub it again. I mean, I had to scrub, 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 scrub. Yes, thank you, Lord, for the blood. Absolutely. I scrubbed and scrubbed and scrubbed and scrubbed because for some reason, even though I knew it was clean, I remembered what it looked like when I bought it. And I needed to clean it again before I could put make use of it. And see, that's what I think about here. If we are not walking in sanctification, we become blind. If we're not striving to do better every day. Yes, we have grace, and y'all understand, grace is there. Grace is the whole point. But we still have to walk in this walk. We become blind when we're not working this all out with fear and trembling. We can't see far off. We can't see what the future's going to hold, so we give up. It's not getting any better. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going crazy. I bothering to do all this. Everybody else is doing fine. Hey, there's a lady down the road goes to church every Sunday 
Wendy, she's wonderful. Everybody loves her, and she, she don't have to do the stuff I have to do. Why other? She's walking her. I'm walking my walk. Can't walk my Christian life. Can't walk down my road comparing it to that person over there. They walk out their own station and I've got my. I have got to do what the Lord reveals in my life. My walk is not your walk. You got a whole different set of situations to deal with. But we all have to do all this stuff. We all have to add virtue and godliness and temperance and and, and walk knowledge and have patience. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I'm so sorry. Hmm. Does in everybody doing the enemy thing? If we do not respond to his gift of grace, we are nursed and cannot grow in sanctity. Yes, yes, yes. Absolutely. Okay, y'all, I've got two people that said the broadcast was interrupted. So, I'm wondering if y'all are gone or are you back? to show to viewers. Well, I'm going to keep going and I'll post this on YouTube. Hopefully it's still working. Okay. Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not our, your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you reprobate. Examine yourselves whether you have faith. Prove your own selves. If Jesus Christ is in you, you should be walking that out. And this is the way to do it and not fall. Verse 10. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. And I want to say something about your foundation. Your foundation needs to be built on one fact. That Jesus Christ came into this world with a sinless life, a perfect life. Died on the cross. He didn't have to. He chose to die on that cross to take our place. He was... He died, he was buried, he rose again the third day, and that sacrifice of his blood is the payment for our eternal security. That is grace. We didn't deserve it, and he did it. And that's how you begin. But when born again, you have walked that walk out until the final day when you become fully sanctified and live in eternity. And that's what I'm talking about. We gain through grace and grace discovers us all through our life. But if if you're walking through this life thinking grace, 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 boy, are you, you miss out. There's a lot of good stuff out here, and we need to be growing everything in the Word. We need growing in our education. We need growing in knowledge and understanding. We need to keep moving forward as we embrace all time. I think I'm grace. I, I, I can't. No, there's no human words to express what it means. It's just impossible but because it's so important. But we got to walk a walk that is worthy of being called a child of God. And so, my, like I said, my Bible study this week was about not falling, not falling away. And um, I hope y'all enjoyed it. I'm going to close it out. Um, I loved all your comments. I'm so thankful y'all joined me. I learned a lot, saw a lot from y'all that makes me want to study even more on this subject. Uh, but I'll try to get this on YouTube. Hopefully it, 
it went the whole distance and um and i'll see y'all next tuesday love y'all bye